The bias is a new house is very good. The other one is working out a lot. We as like engineers in general mm -hmm. from the school take our FE here or uh we don't offer it here, but uh, but a lot of students do take the FE. Um they just do it. How do I think about it? When when can I take it? You can take it, you can take it now. I, I think yeah. you first have to take the EIT, EIT is engineering and training film. Okay. And after you complete that exam, then you're eligible for the FE now. Okay. Yes. And then you take the EIT. When is it like when you graduate? Right? I think, honestly, I think you probably have most of the what you need to know for the EIT half of the third year. I think I think that's what you still need to study for because it's the way they format the exam and the way that it's they give the questions is different. So I think I would honestly wait until after you graduate just so you have more time to kind of prepare. Okay, okay. thank you. Yep. Mm 
That's one for your part. I gave them I don't share the same part. The second one's like easy for the other one. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't. I thought that. Yeah, it's not much. Yeah, I'm not taking it. Yeah. I want to get a start. The one thing for the end. All right, it's uh, one o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Good, good. All right, so today, um, today the plan is uh, we're going to move on. We're done with rate of return, so we're we're kind of in this transition period. Um, so we on Thursday we're going to get we're going to we're going to start to get into tax, but for today we're just kind of do a little bit of wrap up on this first section of economic analysis. And so uh, we're going to learn one more technique called benefit cost ratio. Um, you know, now I think after you've done present worth analysis, annual cash flow, this is relatively simple. So, um, you know, it, we may not kind of take the whole timeline. If we, if we kind of finish early, we'll, uh, we'll go, we'll go ahead and get started on, on taxes stuff, but, um, that's the main plan for today. Uh, of course, you know, the other piece of information you see on the screen right now is information on our midterm exam. Uh, so our midterm exam is going to be next Tuesday. So it'll be from today, March 5th. Okay. Uh, it's going to take place during lecture, and it's going to be an uh, in-person exam. Um, so, you know, for the most part for this semester, you know, I, I don't mind that you you attend the lectures virtually, but uh, for the exams, I do I do want everyone to be here. So there's there's no plans to offer the exam uh, virtually. There's only going to be I'm just going to have the paper copies in front of me. And I'm going to bring that to to the lecture. Okay. Uh, in terms of what you can bring, you can bring your writing utensil, uh, whether it be a pencil, pen, whatever you feel most comfortable with, uh, calculator. Uh, and an eight and a half by 11 sheet of notes. And so you can use both sides of that eight and a half by 11 sheet. Um, you can handwrite it, you can type it, you know, you can just do whatever you most feel comfortable with. Um, gen generally speaking, I, I, I do recommend that you uh, make your own um, set of notes, although that's, that's not a requirement. Uh, I think more than anything last year, I, I saw a lot of people come to the exam and just kind of like frantically copy their friend's cheat sheet kind of right before the exam, which was uh, kind of crazy to me. Um, but I, I do recommend that you make you make your own cheat sheet just because, you know, um, taking all the information that we learned so far, and, and and we have learned quite a bit of information, and condensing that and organizing it and putting it into just one eight and a half by 11 sheet, that by itself is actually already a very good study tool. And so making your own cheat sheet, kind of spending a good amount of time doing that, uh, if you do that, then, then you have already kind of taken care of a big chunk of your study. So I definitely recommend doing that. Okay. Um, the only requirement that I have for the uh, for the cheat sheet is that it's legible. Um, so no additional tools, no magnifying glasses, no you know phone things you know are, are allowed to kind of read your own notes. 
Uh, I've heard I, this. This hasn't happened in my class, but I've heard stories of people bringing like 3D glasses, like the red blue thing, and like people printing like two cheat sheets on one, so you can kind of when you view, view the red and the blue together. So none of that, no extra props. Just you have to be able to read it with your with your naked eye. That's that's the only requirement that that. that okay. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, writing in the compound interest table. So the cheat sheet is just for your own notes. Um, I'll provide the compound interest table, so that's that that you don't have to worry about. Uh, and I, I'll make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to print out the entire compound interest table that's like 35 pages. I'm only, I'm probably only going to print out just like, um, just like two, two tables of it, but I'll make sure that all the problems use those interest rates. Okay. Um, so you, you'll be able to do the exam with just the compound interest. Rate, okay. Uh, of course, you know, you can, you can use the formulas if you would like, but all the problem solving questions you, you, you should be able to do with the compound interest tables. Uh, in terms of uh, other content, uh, I will be posting a study guide for the for the midterm exam. So that's that's um, going to be up hopefully by today. Uh, I was I was trying to get it done this morning, but uh, I got caught up doing some some other stuff, so I wasn't able to do it. Um, I'm also going to post the homework solutions on Canvas, and so that's going to be homeworks. Uh, for now, it's going to be just homeworks one and two, and then after you guys turn in homework three, I'll post the solutions for homework three uh, as well. Okay, so you have all of those available to study. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of that uh, um, today, hopefully. Uh, in terms of the format of the exam, there's going to be four short answer questions. And so very similar to problem ones that you've been seeing on the homeworks. And so I'll give you a question that you can answer usually within, you know, two or three or four sentences. Uh, maybe I'll have you draw a picture, draw a, a, a cash flow diagram, something like that. Okay. So that'll be worth 40% of the points. And then there's going to be three problem solving questions worth 60% of the points. And so by problem solving questions, I mean things like present worth analysis, annual cash flow analysis, um, you know, maybe like a, just a, just the cash flow conversion, maybe a non-standard conversion. Um, you know, there'll be three of those problems worth 60% of the points. Okay. Um, usually, usually for this exam, usually uh, time is, is not an issue. Um, I, I, I haven't had, you know, uh, students not completing the exam just because these problems just don't, just don't take very long, but, you know, just always just be aware of the time and, and just know that we, we only have the lecture time. So 75 minutes to, to complete the exam. Um, all right. Any questions on the on the exam for next Tuesday? All right. So remember, I, I have office hours too. So I have office hours today after the lecture. I have, I have office hours Thursday, uh, and then I have one more office hours on Monday. So there's so if you have questions that you want to, you want to have answered on the homeworks or you're confused by a certain topic, um, come to um, you know come to come to the office hours. Okay. Right. Oh, uh, content too. So I uh, remember the so the most recent thing that we just did last week was rate of return. Uh, rate of return will not be on the midterm exam. Rate of return is going to be on the second midterm. So the midterm is just going to cover everything that we've covered up from week one up until annual cash flow analysis. So annual cash flow analysis is the last is the last thing you'll be responsible for for this. Okay, that'll it'll all be outlined on the study guide, but just but just kind of just verbally say it right now too. Okay. All right. So that, that'll be the exam. So, um, you know, make sure you guys are, are studying for that and you're ready for that. Okay. So let's, uh, so let's get started with the um, topic for today. Okay. So the topic for today is, is a technique called benefit cost ratio analysis. Okay, so benefit cost ratio analysis. This is kind of a um, I, I call it kind of like a wrap up topic. So we're we're just about kind of wrapping up. You know, we're basically wrapping up kind of the first midterm stuff. Okay, so so far, so far we have learned. I would say the, the three main economic analysis techniques. So the first, of course, being present worth analysis. Second of which being annual cash flow. And then most recently, what we've uh, learned is rate of return analysis. Okay. 
Okay. So these three together are kind of the first three, I would say kind of building blocks that you would learn in kind of a basic economics class, because not only, not only are the techniques themselves useful, but I think like a lot of the intuition and a lot of the concepts that we learn uh, through these techniques is useful just for understanding just basic economics uh, in general, okay? The idea of, you know, uh, the time value of money, the idea of converting between different um, different types of cash flow, uh, the idea of an, uh, um, an amortization table, right? Uh, quantifying loans, and then the idea of, you know, interest rates and rate of return, right? So these, these three things together, you know, I would say at this point, we have a pretty good picture of kind of, you know, the foundation of, of, of economic analysis in general. So a lot of textbooks, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, um, classes that you would take in engineering economics would focus, you know, first on those three techniques. Okay. With that said, you know, um, there, there are other ways that we can kind of modify this analysis or kind of different ways that we can present our results um, that are more useful in certain situations. So there's, there's actually a, a collection of these. And actually, if you look in the textbook, there's a whole chapter and the chapter is literally called Other Analysis Techniques. And so these other analysis techniques don't really introduce anything new. It's really just kind of, they're all just kind of different spins off what we of what we learn um, just to kind of present the information in a somewhat different way that's more useful, okay? So we're, we're not gonna go over all of them because honestly, a lot of them are, are kind of not very, are very useful. But I think the one that is probably the most useful that uh, that is kind of interesting to, uh, to visualize is benefit cost ratio analysis, okay? And so just like the name implies, in benefit-cost ratio analysis, we're going to be computing a ratio, and the ratio is of the benefits over the cost, okay? And so we have a formula, I have a formula for you. So the benefit-cost ratio is going to be a ratio, so we have a fraction here, okay? And on top of the fraction here, we have the present word of all the benefits in a particular project or economic alternative, okay? And then on the bottom here, we have the present word of all of the costs, okay? So it's literally just, you're just taking the ratio of the benefits and the costs, just like the name of costs, okay? I think, the thing, I think the thing that kind of trips people up a little bit is that you actually have to convert everything to a present word, okay? Right. In the same way, if you want to do it this using an annual cash flow form, you can do EUAB, which is the equivalent uniform annual benefits. And then you're going to put that on top of EUAC, which is the equivalent uniform annual cost. Okay. So ideally, you know, in order for a project to be worthwhile, what we say is that the ratio of the benefits to the cost should be greater than one. Okay. That tells us that, you know, whatever investment, whatever project, whatever engineering project that we're undergoing, you know, it's going to be, it's going to provide more benefits than, than costs. In other words, you know, in, in, in just purely financial terms, you know, our project, we want our projects to be more profitable than it costs to run. All right, so you can see how this is this is kind of just a, very much just a spin off of present worth analysis and annual cash flow. It's just it's just a different way to present it. Okay. 
One interesting thing, though, is that if you if you want to, right, if you want to use benefit cost ratio to perform a comparison, okay. and so you're going to use benefit cost ratio to compare between different options, like we usually do. Okay. We have to use the same technique that we use during rate of return, which is, you know, um, to do incremental analysis. And if you recall from using incremental analysis, you're going to take the higher cost option. And subtract from that the lower cost option. Okay. And that's purely just based on initial cost. So you're going to do that for the benefits. And so you're going to take all the benefits from the higher cost option, subtract the lower the benefits of the lower cost option. You're going to take all the costs, the cost of the higher cost option minus the cost of the lower cost option, uh, and then take the take the ratio from, from there. Okay. All right. So I have an, I have an example next. Uh, and what you'll see is that you know we have we have all the tools that we need to uh, do this analysis is just kind of just doing this extra step of computing the ratio. All right, any questions on any questions on this before we jump into an example? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do an example. And in fact, this example is one that we've done before. So we're just going to redo redo a previous example but with benefit cost ratio. Okay. Okay. So in this example here, uh, we are deciding between two machines to buy. So let's list out the uh, the cash flows for each of these options. Okay. So for machine A, we have an initial cost of ten thousand dollars. Okay. And uh, we have a revenue of three thousand three thousand dollars per year. Then we have machine B. Machine B has an initial cost of 13500 Revenue for each year for machine B is going to be $3,000. But with machine B, we have an additional scale. So this revenue is going to increase per year. All right, so for this problem, we're going to assume our interest rate here is 7%, and we have an analysis period of five years. Okay, so if I is equal to 7 and N is equal to 5. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use benefit cost ratio to determine which, uh, which machine to purchase.
All right, I think this may be the third or fourth time we've done this exact example. So this is this is the last time, I promise. And last time we're going to see machine A, machine B. So, um, you know, we'll make sure we'll make sure we do it right. Any questions on just the on just the setup of the problem? Okay. All right. So let's get to it. And so we know we know that um, you know if we if we really wanted to make a good comparison between the two. We have to do incremental analysis, right? So we have to take machine B. Machine B here is the higher cost option, right? That one has the higher initial cost. And so we're going to take machine B minus machine A um, and then do the ratio from there. Okay. But just to get some practice, um, let's compute the individual um, benefit cost ratio of each option. We won't be able to use this information to determine which one is the, is the better one, but you know it's at least good practice, right? Because we, we we haven't done this before. Okay, okay. So let's do machine A. Okay, so I'm going to do everything in terms of present worth, just because present worth is for me is the easiest to, to think about. Okay, so in order to compute the ratio, we need to compute the the present worth of the benefits. And then the present worth of the costs. Okay. And then we're going to take the ratio between those two. All right. So for the for machine A, our benefits are just coming strictly from the revenue, right? So that's three hundred three thousand dollars per year. Um, and since that is a uniform amount, a recurring cash flow that we're getting each year, that is a uniform series, right? So to convert it to a present sum, we have to take our three thousand dollars per year multiply it by a conversion factor. So our conversion factor is going to be P over A. Okay. Our interest rate is 7%. And our number of time periods is, um, is five. Okay. All right. So we can look this up in the table. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this conversion factor right here, uh, I do have it. It's 4.1, zero, zero. Okay. As we multiply those together, we get 3,000 times 4.100. We get 12,300. Okay. Right. Then we have the present worth of the cost. And so our only cost here is the initial cost, which is $10,000. That initial cost is already in present form because that's that's an amount that we would pay today. So we, we don't need to do any conversion. Okay. All right. So we take these two. We, we compute the ratio. Okay. Take present worth of the benefits. Divide by present worth of the costs. So we take 12,300 divided by 10,000. We punch that into a calculator. We get 1.23. Okay. So we can see from this, uh, um, from, this, from this result here that if we go with machine A, so let's say machine A was our only option, right? And we were just determining whether or not, you know, this is actually going to be a good, a good investment, right? So this is telling us that machine A, if, if we were to go with machine A, you know, we would at least earn, you know, money on our, on our investment, right? So this tells us that machine A is, is, is good by itself. But whether or not machine A is a better investment than machine B, we have yet we have yet to determine. Okay, so let's do the same thing. So let's do uh, present uh, benefit cost ratio analysis for um, machine B. Okay, so just like uh, just like up there, we're going to take the present worth of the benefits 
and present worth of costs. So for the benefits for machine B, we have our $3,000 per year revenue. So that is a uniform series. So just like for machine A, we're going to take 3,000 and multiply by P over A, 7% and 5, okay? But then also for machine B, we also have our gradient as well. So we have a $500 gradient. That's the amount that the revenue is going to increase per year. So that's P over G, 7%, and 5, okay? All right, so we can look up these uh, these conversion factors in the table. We, re we already know this P over A, so this P over A is the same as, um, same as above. So this is 4.100, zero, zero, okay? And then this P over G factor, this P over G for 7% and 5 is 7 points. Six four seven. All right, so we uh, we plug both of those into our calculator, and what we get is sixteen thousand under twenty. Right, so that's the present worth of all the benefits for machine B. Now we have the costs. And so the, the present worth of the cost for machine B, the only cost that we have is just the 13,500, the initial cost. Okay. And so since that 13,500 is already in present, present format, that is an amount that we're paying today. Um, we don't need to do any conversion. So we just leave it as it is. All right, and so taking this information, we can compute the ratio. So the benefit to cost ratio is um, 16,120 divided by 13,500. And what we get from this is 1.19. Okay, so if we can see from this too that machine B is also it's also a good a, a good investment. Okay, because we get more benefits than than costs, right? So that's that the fact that our ratio is greater than one tells us that. And so if you look at their two ratios, right? So you look at the ratio for machine A, you get 1.23. And we see the ratio for machine B is 1.19, right? You would be tempted to look at this and say that, you know, machine A is the better option. It has, it has better, um, you know, benefits to cost ratio. But of course, you know, we can't make that determination yet. We have to do incremental analysis, okay? Because even though, you know, even though machine A does give you a better ratio on its own, right? The fact that you're even considering machine B means that you have at least $13,500 of budget that, that you have, right? And so if you go with machine A, you would only spend $10,000 of that of that budget and you'd have that $3,500 left over, okay? Um, and so is, is, and so the question is, is machine A so good that it's it's you can actually you know save that thirty five hundred dollars and it's and it's wouldn't be a waste. Well, let's find out. Okay. okay.
All right, so remember the way that we do incremental analysis is we take the higher cost option versus the lower, minus the lower cost, okay? But when we're doing this with the benefit cost ratio, we're gonna do this individually for all the costs and individually for all the benefits, okay? Let me show you what I mean. So let's take the present worth. Okay. We're gonna take the present worth of the incremental benefits. I don't know why I didn't show you that. That's certainly long name for a for, for Okay. Okay. So the um the the uh the operation that we're gonna do here is machine A, or I should say the benefits of machine A, or excuse me, benefits of machine B. B is the more expensive one. Okay, minus the benefits. We're going to take the benefits of machine B and subtract the benefits of machine A. Okay. All right. So what are the benefits of machine B? Well, we just we just computed it here, right? And in fact, we already have an expression in terms of present work. And so let's let's go ahead and just move that move that down here. Okay. Okay. So the benefits of machine B. Let me go ahead and put it in in a brackets here. Okay. So the benefits of machine B. We have three thousand. E over A, 7%, and 5, okay, plus 500, E over G, 7%, and 5, okay. <clears throat> So those two terms there are the benefits of machine B, from this, we're going to we're going to subtract the benefits of machine A. So machine A, if you kind of scroll back up to the top here, okay. The benefits of machine A, we only have the three thousand p over A seven percent and five. Okay, we have three thousand p over A seven percent. is should be okay benefits of machine b minus benefits of machine a okay we're ignoring the cost now the cost we're going to take care of in a second okay so before we plug in any conversion factors here, we can see that we have an identical term um, on the first set of brackets and the second set, right? So both machine B and machine A have this 3000 P over A, 7% five. Okay? And if we're gonna subtract them, then these two things are gonna cancel out. So that's gonna cancel out with that. And so all we're left with here is the present worth of the present worth of the incremental benefits this is equal to 500 p over g seven percent and five okay we already know the conversion factor for this the conversion factor for this is 7.647 and so we plug that in here we get 3800 okay 382 Okay, let's do the same thing for the cost. And so the present worth of the incremental cost. Okay. So just like we did with the incremental benefits, we're going to take the cost of machine B and the uh, and subtract from that the cost of machine A. Okay. For the for this example here, it's pretty easy just because you know we only have the initial cost. There's no maintenance, right? And so we have we just we're just going to subtract their initial cost. And so the initial cost for machine B is 13,500. The initial cost for machine A is 10,000. Okay. We subtract these two, what we get is 
3,500. Okay. All right, and so if we take their ratio, This is their incremental ratio. And so our benefits, our incremental benefits here is 3,820. The incremental cost is 3,500, okay? As we take their ratio, what we get is 1.09. Okay. Since, since this is greater than one, it's going to be the same thing, same same uh, same logic as what we did for rate of return. So since since we got a uh, a ratio here that's greater than one, this tells us it's better to invest in the higher cost option. which for this problem, the higher cost option is machine P. Okay. And of course the opposite is true too. If we took the, if we computed the incremental ratio and this was less than one, then that tells us the better, the better option would be to invest in the lower cost option. Remember, you know, when, when you have two options here that have different costs and you're choosing between them, right? Choosing the lower cost option inherently means that you're taking whatever money that you have left over in your budget and you're investing it in the market, okay? In this case, the market rate is the same as the given interest rate, so it's, it's 7%. And so, you know, if, if the ratio that we found here was less than one, so let's say 0 0.95 or something like that, then it would, it would be better to take the difference in our costs here and invest it in the market at 7%, okay? But since the incremental ratio that we got here was greater than one, um, you know the best the the best use of that thirteen thousand five hundred would be to just put it all on machine B, and let that generate revenue over the next uh, over the next All right, questions on, on this example here? Okay. All right, so that's the basics of a uh, benefit cost ratio. So you can see that it's you know. Um, in the end, you know, we're, we're, we're getting the same result, right? So just evidenced by the fact we've done this same example four different times. And so, you know, benefit cost ratio doesn't, doesn't provide anything new, um, you know, uh, explicitly, but it does give us a, a different way to kind of view um, these kinds of comparison results. Because right? uh, I think, because I think the thing with the human mind is that, you know, we, we think of ratios and, and ratios are something that's fairly easy for the human mind to comprehend. And so being able to present your analysis results in a ratio, I think will kind of help communicate your results to, to people, okay? So that's all this really is. This is just a different way to kind of do the same analysis uh, just for the purpose of putting it in a different way that's a little bit easier to, uh, a little bit easier to understand. Let's talk about some, some variations that we can do. Because one, one thing that's the last example and, and really the definition of benefit cost ratio that we assume is that we're, we're only considering projects that generate revenue, that generate benefits, okay? Okay. 
Because for the vast majority of time, you know, whenever you're considering the benefits of an engineering project, you know, the one that's going to be the most significant is revenue, right? So the things, the things that you can sell, the service that you can sell um, from an engineering project. Okay. But with that said, you know, we, there's a lot of engineering projects that don't directly generate revenue. Uh, either that or, you know, they're kind of far, you know, far along in, in the in the commercial process where it's, it's hard to quantify. Okay. And so in situations that don't strictly generate revenue, you know, we it's computing the ratio is, is almost useless because there, there won't be any benefits that are that are kind of explicitly given. And so the ratio that you get is just zero, right? So you get zero over all the costs, which is, you know, everything has a cost, but not everything has a benefit, unfortunately. Okay. And so, you know, in, in these kinds of situations, and, and we've seen quite a few of these. And so if you look back on our on our previous examples with greater return and and, uh, and and present worth analysis annual cash flow. You know we've done quite a few of these examples that don't necessarily generate revenue on their own. Okay, or at least it's not, or at least it's not quantified. Okay. In these situations, you can you can still use the benefit cost ratio. You just kind of have to expand your definition of what it means to be a benefit. And so a benefit may not strictly just be revenue or, or money that the project is bringing into the company or whatever entity that you're that you're managing. Okay. All right. So for example. Okay. So one one common example that people think of is, is public works projects, right? So works on the roads, the sidewalks, the traffic lights, right? Those don't necessarily generate revenue. And so in public works projects, you know, you may not be able to quantify the benefits in terms of, you know, revenue that's coming in, right? It's not, it's not like you pay to use the, the craft plan, right? Um, but you can quantify benefits in other ways. So maybe you compute the benefits as, you know, benefits to the public. Right. And there's and there's often ways to compute this. And so, you know, one, you know, one very common public works projects that you see in California is, you know, maybe you maybe you add a, a traffic lane, right? So maybe you add a lane to a freeway. Um, and so, you know, that that doesn't necessarily have a quantifiable um, benefit uh, unless it unless it's a uh, unless it's a fast lane where they literally do charge you to, to, to drive on that road. But let's let's assume that we're not we're not doing that. Right. But you can quantify in terms of, you know, how much time you're saving people. Right. Um, you know, allowing people to get to their destination faster by, you know, by widening the freeway. Um, you can you can quantify in terms of, you know, the amount of accidents that it's, it's preventing. OK, um, generally speaking, the, the wider your road is, you know, it's, it's there's less likely uh, it's less likely for accidents to occur. OK, 
to quantify in terms of saved medical expenses or maybe saved tax dollars in terms of you, know, you don't have to send police out there to, as often. Okay. Um, and so there's there's other ways that you can quantify the benefit other than just um, other than just you know money that is generating bring it back into okay. So we're actually going to do an example like that as well. Another situation where you you may want to modify the strict definition of benefit cost ratio um, is to um, do it in terms of time. Well, so for certain companies, you know, and these are companies that often have a kind of take on projects with a long project horizon. So these are things like construction companies. Okay, they may like to compute the ratio in terms of all future cash flows divided by the initial costs. And so in the numerator of the, uh, of the of the ratio here, they have all future cash flows. So this includes all, um, all benefits, all future sum, all, everything, right? Maintenance costs. So basically any cash flow that doesn't occur in the present, they're gonna put it on, on top, right? And they're gonna use the appropriate sign for it as well. So if you have like the maintenance cost, that's gonna be negative. Okay, so you can put that in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have all the initial costs. Okay, so it's a, it's a slight modification on the ratio where you know, typically in a ratio you put up all the benefits up, up top, all the positive cash flows, and then all the costs on the bottom, which includes the initial cost, the maintenance costs, overhaul costs, things like things like that. Okay, but under this, uh, under this kind of paradigm right here, you just put all future cash flows, whether they be a benefit or a cost, you put that up top, and then all of the initial costs you put on the bottom. Okay. And so this is kind of a nice spin just because of, you know, uh, if you if your company is about to make a very large present day investment, you want to see kind of, you know, what is the return? What is the ratio on that investment based on all future future returns? OK, so just a small kind of tweak to it. So, you know, there's there's different ways that you can kind of tweak this ratio to kind of fit um, kind of fit kind of the message that you're trying to um, you know, message that you're trying to convey in your analysis. OK. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. I have one more example today. This is a public works example. Okay. So let's say that the city uh, will will give it will uh, will make it more concrete. We'll say the city of Fullerton wants to improve traffic flows by adding more lanes on the road. All right, and there are two there are two options that they were winning. All right, so on the one hand, uh, they can add more right turn lanes, so they can go to a lot of the traffic lights in Fullerton and add more lanes for turning right. And so if they were to add right turn lanes, let's quantify some of these uh, these numbers here. So we have the initial cost, of course. 
And so the initial cost of adding right turn lanes is going to be $8.1 million. Or 8.9, excuse me. We have the annual maintenance costs. Okay. So this is a cost that's going to occur each year. We have an annual maintenance cost of $150,000. Okay. So of course, you know, this is a public works, public works project. And so, you know, adding more right turn lanes is not going to generate any revenue, right? No one's out there charging you no one's out there charging your credit card to make a right turn on, on your Belinda Boulevard, right? Um, but it is going to cause a disruption, right? So anytime you, you add any kind of construction to the road, it's going to make people kind of choose a different path or kind of, you know, navigate around the traffic, which is going to take longer, right? So we, we, do, we, we do have a way to quantify. We have an initial disruption to the public, okay? And so just based on the lost time, lost productivity, um, that's that's kind of averaged around in the industry in the area. You know, it's, uh, your analyst has determined this is about $900,000, okay? And so in that first year that you are, um, uh, that, you're, that you're forming this, uh, um, you're, you're, you're kind of constructing these extra right turn lanes. It's going to cause a disruption of almost $1 million. Okay. But after that first initial disruption, this is going to add benefit to the, to the public, right? And again, this is not something that, you know, is, 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 uh, you know, directly quantified. It's not revenue that's generating, but it's just, Increased productivity, you know, less accidents, things, things like that. And so if we were to add um, right turn lanes, it would add an annual benefit of $1.6 million. Okay. Okay, the other alternative is to uh, construct left turn lanes, okay? Left turn lanes are inherently more expensive just because you have to, you know, the disruption is in the middle of the road instead of on the on the side. And so the initial cost for left turn lanes here is gonna be 11.9 million. Annual maintenance cost for left turn lanes is, is also slightly higher. And that's $225,000, okay? That's maintaining a lot of the sensors, a lot of the road quality, things like that, things like that, okay? All right, so the, the construction of the, uh, of the left turn lanes is also gonna cause an initial disruption to the public. Okay. Adding left turn lanes is, is always gonna be more disruptive than the right because it's, you know, you're, you're putting the construction right in the middle of the road. Um, there's higher risk. You have kind of construction workers kind of working in the middle of the road too. And so the initial disruption is going to be $2.1 million. Okay. And then the annual benefit to the public, um, you know, adding more left turn lanes is going to give you a better benefit. So it's going to give you uh, $2.2 .2 million of, of annual benefit. Okay. So those are all the numbers between the two options. Okay. If we assume if we assume an interest rate of 10% and uh, our analysis period is 15 years, Let's use benefit cost ratio to determine which which option we should go.
Okay. Any questions on the uh, any questions on just the setup of the problems? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So of course, you know, this is a public works project. So we don't you know there's no revenue really to speak of. Everything is, is in benefit of the public. So let's use let's use a modified ratio to analyze this problem. So the ratio that we're going to use here is uh, on the numerator here. On the numerator, we're going to have um, all the direct effects to the public. Okay. And so if you look in the table, that's going to be rows three and four. Notice that we have both costs and benefits associated with here. Okay. Right, so we have our initial disruption, which is a, a cost, an effective cost, and then we have our annual public benefit, which is a, a benefit, okay? So we're going to put all the effects of the public on top. And then in the denominator on the bottom here, that's going to be the amount of money that the government is actually paying out, both in the present day and also in the future, okay? So this is rows one and two, okay? Because that's money that has to be directly paid from either the city or the state or the county, right? Right, so we're taking literally the direct ratio of kind of the uh, public benefit to government spent. Okay, okay so it's, it's a modified ratio, right? So it's, it's not strictly just benefits over costs. We have public versus, you know, on government spent. All right, so just like, just like we did for the previous example, let's let's do each one individually uh, first, uh, even though eventually we know that we're going to have to do the increment. But just to, just to get some more practice, let's do each ratio independently. Okay, so let's do right turns first. All right, so in the numerator of our ratio here, we're gonna put all of the effects of the public. Uh, even though the ratio that we're using is different, we still have to, we still have to abide by our kind of our, our economic analysis principles. And so we have to convert everything to the same type of cash flow. Okay. And so I'm going to choose present uh, present sums. Okay. So for the for the effects of the public, we have our initial public disruption. Okay. So for right turn lanes, that is a negative nine hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And then the other effect of the public that we have is the annual benefit. So this is 1.6 million. So of course that is a benefit, but since it is an annual benefit, it is a uniform series. And so to convert it to a present sum, we have P over A, 10% and 15, okay. All right, then on the bottom here, we have government spending. And so everything that the government has to pay out, we have two main costs here that the government has to spend. We have its initial cost of 8.9 million plus, okay. And notice how I'm using positive signs here for the denominator, Just that's just to make sure that our ratio here is, is a positive number, okay? Then we have the annual maintenance cost that the government has to pay. So that's 150,000 P over A, 10% and 15, okay. All right, so here we have, we have a pretty straightforward expression. We have one, um, 
one uh, conversion factor to look up either in the tables or through the formulas. Uh, I don't have that conversion factor here in fourth I just have the result. And so we compute this, we get 1.122. Okay. All right, so let's do the same thing from left turn lengths. All right, so for this one, I'm, I'm just going to go a little bit faster. It's just the same setup as the previous ratio, it's just uh, uh, with different numbers. All right, so first we have the initial disruption to the public, so that's 2.1 million. Then we have the annual benefit of 2.2 million. And then we have the government spending. So we have government spending here. Our initial cost is 11.9 million plus annual maintenance, 225,000. And so we compute this out. Yeah, 1.212. So from this analysis here, we can see that both options are attractive, right? So matter, no matter if we choose left turn lanes or right turn lanes, um, you know, we, we're going to end up with, uh, with something good. Here. We have a good use of taxpayer money, which is definitely not the norm nowadays, but at least, at least it is in our picture, our fictional world. All right, any questions on, on this? Aren't the signs on the bottom supposed to be negative? Right, so so typically on the denominator there, we uh, those are all costs. But just to make sure that our ratio is uh, is a positive number, uh, we just we make the cost positive. Yeah, so same 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 convention that we used um, for the previous system. Okay. All right. So of course, you know, this, uh, this analysis by itself is not, is not good enough to determine which is better to use. So let's go ahead and jump into our incremental analysis. Okay. And so in our incremental analysis, we um, are going to take the difference between the higher cost option and the lower cost option. So for our example here, the higher cost option is the left turn lanes. Okay. That one has the higher initial cost. And the lower cost option is the right turn lanes. Okay. But remember, you know, we're defining our ratio a little bit differently here. So we're gonna take the increment of both the uh, public effects and the increment on the government spending. All right, so so one way that you can think about it, and and you know even though doing it individually here is not you know not enough, you know it does actually help you um, in setting up the increment because what we have here, if we look at the numerator on the left turn lanes, that is the effects to the public. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring that down here. So we have a minus two point one million plus two point two million. E over A, 10%, and 15, okay? So that is the effects of the public from the left turn higher cost option. Okay. And then if we come up here, 
we look at the numerator for the right turn lane, that's going to be the effects of the public from the lower cost option, right turn. So let's go ahead and bring that down here as well. But remember, you know, because the right turn lanes is the lower cost option, we're going to add a, a minus sign there. Okay. So this is minus 900,000 plus 1.5 million, or excuse me, 1.6 million. P over A, 10%, 15. Okay. All right, so we can we can do the arithmetic here. We have one uh, we have one um, conversion factor to look up. Um, and so if we punch that in, we get around three point three six four million dollars. So that right there is the incremental effect to the public. Okay. All right. So let's do the same thing with the denominators. So we're going to take our two denominators and subtract them from each other. Okay. All right, so first we start with the uh, the left turn lanes. Okay. So the denominator of our left turn lanes is um, 11.9 million. Okay. Plus 225,000. P over A, 10% and 15. From that, we're going to subtract uh, the government spending for the right turn lanes. So that here is 8.9 million plus the annual maintenance, which is 150,000. So once again, we can punch all this into a calculator and what we get is 3.57 million. All right, so now that we have the, we computed the increment on the public uh, good or the public uh, effects. We, we've computed the increment on the government spending. Now we can just take the ratio of these two, so divide them out. Okay. The ratio is going to be 3.364 million divided by 3.57 million. Okay. And we compute this, and what we get is 0 0.942. All right, and so and, and so since this is less than one, right? This is not uh, um, you know greater than one. This tells us the better uh, the better option would be to go with the lower cost option. The lower cost option being the right turn. Actually, any questions on, on that example there? Okay. 
All right. So, so benefit cost ratio analysis, it's another, another technique for you to use, um, you know, in terms of calculations, there's nothing, there's nothing new, right? It's just, it's just using our same present worth, say, using our same compound interest tables. Um, so just to, just to kind of present our information in, in a different way. Okay. All right. So we have about five minutes left. Um, so I, let me, let me just try to just br very briefly introduce the next, the next topic. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely going to get more in depth with it on, on Thursday. So, you know, don't, you know, don't feel like you have to absorb anything right now, but I at least want to give you kind of the general direction in which we're in which we're going to go. Okay. So the next big unit, and and we are going to spend a bit of time here, is all about taxes and depreciation. Okay. So up until this point, you know, we've 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 learned our economic analysis uh, strategies, right? Um, but we've we've been ignoring taxes the, the whole time. Which is fine to do when when you're uh, when you're first starting out, but you know in reality, you know if you're running a business uh, or even just for your own personal expenses, you know taxes are something that is a pretty significant um, you know expense that you have to account for, right? And uh, when you're doing it for businesses for big engineering projects, you know taxes can get pretty complicated. Okay. So the idea behind tax is that you know, if you if you are a resident or if you operate your business in, in a country, right, a country that provides public goods like fire departments, police, road work, things like that, right, uh, any percentage or, or a certain per, or a certain percentage of the any money that you earn um, through your labor through your job is uh, is is given as payment to the government for these public goods. Okay. Right. So if you work, if you work a job, you know, you earn a certain salary, right? Do, typically people report kind of their, their year, their, their, what's called their gross salary. That's before taxes, right? And so, you know, every paycheck that you get, you know, you, you're going to see that there's a gross amount. That's the amount that the business is paying, paying out, right? But then a certain percentage of that gets taken away from taxes, right? It's always, it's always a percentage of that. Of course, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of laws that, that regard taxes. And what we're going to focus on is how to um, deduct taxes. Okay. 
And so when people talk about um, deductions or they talk about um, writing off things on, on their taxes, what they mean is um, you know, reducing the amount of tax that they pay by um, reducing their taxable income. Okay. And how you how you kind of play and 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 at the end of the day, you know, it, it kind of just becomes a game. So how you play the kind of the de deduction game, the write-off games, you know, some companies that are very skilled at this kind of can kind of can avoid paying a lot of taxes. Um, and it's kind of essential to, to kind of running a, an effective business. Okay. And so that's that's kind of the direction that we're going to go. And so, you know, starting on Thursday, we're going to talk about, you know, what 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 are certain things or what are certain expenses that a company can write off? How can they deduct things? Okay, um, and how that factors into very large um, equipment purchases? Because you know if you if you kind of if you kind of look at the kind of the uh, the trend that we've been doing in a lot of our examples and a lot of our problems, you know a lot of our uh, examples have to do with the purchase of very large pieces of of, uh, of engineering equipment, whether they be things like pumps, whether they be things like vehicles, right? Um, and so how we kind of deduct those from our taxes is, is actually a quite a complicated process called depreciation. And we'll start that on first. Okay. Any questions on, on this before we wrap it up for today? Okay. All right. So on Thursday, we'll pick it up from here. So we'll talk about, we'll start talking about taxes and depreciation and uh, we'll go from there. All right. So remember, uh, midterm is going to be next uh, Tuesday. So make sure you guys are studying for it. If you have questions, uh, don't be afraid to come to office hours or reach out through email. Um, you can expect the study guide and the homework solutions to be up uh, later today. Uh, so we hope you guys have a good rest of your day, and I will see you on Thursday. Hey, Professor. <laughs>
for what? So with interest rate and four years. Oh wait, so F over A, you pretend like it's here. Exactly, right. So you pretend like it's here. It is it's actually over here, right? Mm -hmm. But then by doing F over A, you kind of you kind of lump together all of these expenses into one year, which is the last year of the of the repeat, twenty one. Right? Okay. And then you need to move to compute this to present work. You need to move that back to the present day here. So then you do a P over S in order to move it back. So F over A, P over A. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Three part A. Okay. Cool. So I get that I need to do forty percent of the fifty two hundred. Yeah, fifty two thousand. And after that, is where I'm set. Okay. So the amount, so the amount that you're um, that you're paying out is sixty percent of of whatever's left, right? Um, and then that's that's going to be your loan amount. So that's your initial uh, peak, I guess you can say, right? And so from there. Um, you would compute basically the present day value of the loan. So you have to do this in two steps. So the first thing you would do is you convert, first you compute the monthly payment. And so the monthly payment would be A over P, um, 2% and 24 payments. And then you're gonna do P, um, you're gonna take that amount, the, the loan amount, or not the, the payment amount. And then you're gonna do P over A. You too. Um, and then you're going to take however many, however many payments you have left. And so after you make 17 payments, you have 70 left. It'd be easier if I write it down. Yeah, let's write it down. Okay. So first thing you do, we have 52,000. You multiply this by 0 0.6. This gives you your initial loan amount. Right? So that's the amount that you're borrowing from the bank. Right? Mm -hmm. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take this amount, you're going to convert it to a uniform series. And so you can do A over P, 2%, 24, right? What this is going to give you is this is your monthly payment amount. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to call this A, just for simplicity, right? So you take 52,000, multiply 0 0.6, multiply this by, by this conversion factor. This gives you some amount A. Uh, just because I'm too lazy to calculate. And so from and then to compute how much you have left on the loan, you're going to take A, and you're going to take P over A, 2%. And the N here is going to be the amount of payments from me. So with after you made 17 payments, that means you have seven left. So it's a little bit of a roundabout process. So first you compute the payment amount, and then after you compute the payment amount, then you do a P over A with the same interest rate. And then the, the end that you use just, is just however many payments that you have left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.